Let's turn now to the suffrage movement as it evolved in the last decade before suffrage was achieved. We're at the New York Historical Society and we're talking to Louise Bernicau, an independent scholar, an author, a speaker, uh, and somebody who's been writing about the suffrage movement, particularly in New York State and New York City, for the last two decades or so. Uh, Louise, tell us first who was involved in the suffrage movement in this last decade before success? Well, just about everybody. Um, you could start in terms of social classes by remembering that the women who were working women in New York and New York City and were beginning to organize um, after the Triangle Fire, after the strikes that the workers organized themselves for better pay and safer work conditions, they began to, to get the idea or, or to um, appreciate the idea that the ballot might be a way to improve their working lives. Many of them had resisted sort of bourgeois democracy um, and the idea of voting, but we're coming around now to becoming part of the suffrage movement and aiming for the vote to improve the lives of workers. Tell us how you think or how they thought that their lives would be improved if they had the vote? Well, clearly, you can see very early, as early as 1908, that the women who are in the suffrage movement are pairing equal pay for equal work with the right to vote. It's really shocking to see the banners from that year, 1908, before the Triangle Fire, that say equal pay for equal work as part of the umbrella of the suffrage movement. That's one way. And then, of course, the worker protections that are so necessary after the Triangle Fire has shown the world how dangerous, or one of the ways that work was so dangerous for women. So they became convinced that this was another route toward the goal of improved lives. So this is a question of workers, if you like, uh, having a voice in the democratic process or feeling as though they had at least some power to make their voices heard through the ballot. Yes, the ballot was one way to participate in democracy. Um, and that's, that's actually the idea of democracy and of everyone participating is something that also drove women who didn't have that sense of necessity that the working women had. And sometimes you stop and think, they didn't have to participate, for example, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont or Anne Morgan. Tell us about them. Or Louisine Havemeyer, who's another fat. These are all, they're women who are rich because their husbands have made money as tycoons in industrial um, capitalism, which New York is the center of this kind of world of finance. And these women come from marriages. It's really marriages. They've married men who have made fortunes in railroads and banking. And um, Havemeyer was the sugar king of New York. He did refine sugar. Louisine Havemeyer is really exciting because if you know the Havemeyer collection at the Met, which is full of paintings. Louisine Havemeyer was the person responsible for finding, discovering, um, Degas and Mary Cassatt. And after her husband died, after Harry died, Mary Cassatt wrote to Louisine Havemeyer, who was very depressed, and said, get into the suffrage movement. It will improve your mind. And this is actually true. I just want to say uh, many women were widows when they entered the suffrage movement. So they had a certain kind of social freedom, perhaps, and they had money, and they didn't need the things that the working women needed, but they needed, among other things, a sense of purpose. And probably, I don't know if they needed it, but they certainly got a sense of solidarity with other women working toward a good cause. 
So here are women at the top of the income scale, and we've just talked about women at the bottom of the income scale. How do the well-off, wealthy women feel about the immigrant working class workers? Well, sometimes they didn't see them. <laughs> some, some of the rich women didn't see them, but of those who engaged, I'm thinking of Anne Morgan and Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, I would say toward the working class and also toward women who were other, which were not only immigrants but black women, um, both of those, um, what is a kind way to say that they had 10 ears? <laughs> they had 10 ears. I think they both, Alva Belmont most of all, understood that we are talking about all women that you can't ignore the fact that if you believe women should vote, all women should vote. Um, but how you organize that and who's in charge, I'm talking about power. Mm. Who's in charge of this army that you're building <laughs> to fight, it really was a fight, uh, for the vote over all these years in the 20th century? I don't think Alva Belmont had very much sensitivity, nor Anne Morgan, um, to what you said earlier about women speaking for themselves. So I, I'm trying to grapple with, uh, let's talk about New York City just for the purposes of making this a little simpler, but I'm trying to grapple with a suffrage movement which has one group of women who are presumably the leaders of the movement as a whole, who are wealthy, who have money, and yet who are uncomfortable with giving the vote to another group of women, working class women, black women. Uh, have I got that right? No, or? no. The, the point is that um, there were people who didn't believe that working class and immigrant women and black women should be included in this umbrella. But I'm talking about people who actually had philosophically the belief that all women should vote. It's just that they thought they should be in charge of how people did things. Alva Belmont and Anne Morgan were, when Anne Morgan uh, participated in the rallies after the garment workers were on strike in 1909, um, she said, I'm totally in favor of these girls getting their rights, but why do they have to talk about socialism? And she couldn't make the connection between what the politics of many of those working women were. Some of them brought it with them from the countries they came from. Others were caught up in the American socialist desires. Um, when Eugene Debs ran for president on the socialist ticket in 1912, huge numbers of suffragists were part of his campaign. So I'm saying that these um, wealthy women, who some of them, Alva Belmont, did extraordinary, inventive, marvelous things. It's just that she wanted to be in charge. She was accustomed to a very class-based uh, position of power.